This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 17 Day after day wore on, and still there was no perceptible change in the conduct of the islanders towards me. Gradually I lost all knowledge of the regular recurrence of the days of the week, and sunk insensibly into that kind of apathy which ensues after some violent outbreak of despair. My limb suddenly healed, the swelling went down, the pain subsided, and I had every reason to suppose I should soon completely recover from the affliction that had so long tormented me. As soon as I was enabled to ramble about the valley in company with the natives, troops of whom followed me whenever I sallied out of the house, I began to experience an elasticity of mind which placed me beyond the reach of those dismal forebodings to which I had so lately been a prey. Received wherever I went with the most deferential kindness, regaled perpetually with the most delightful fruits, ministered to by dark-eyed nymphs, and enjoying besides all the services of the devoted Cory Cory, I thought that for a sojourn among cannibals no man could have well made a more agreeable one. To be sure there were limits set to my wanderings. Toward the sea my progress was barred by an express prohibition of the savages, and after having made two or three ineffectual attempts to reach it, as much to gratify my curiosity as anything else, I gave up the idea. It was in vain to think of reaching it by stealth, since the natives escorted me in numbers wherever I went, and not for one single moment that I can recall to mind was I ever permitted to be alone. The green and precipitous elevations that stood ranged around the head of the vale where Marheyo's habitation was situated, effectually precluded all hope of escape in that quarter, even if I could have stolen away from the thousand eyes of the savages. But these reflections now seldom obtruded upon me. I gave myself up to the passing hour, and if ever disagreeable thoughts arose in my mind, I drove them away. When I looked around the verdant recess in which I was buried, and gazed up to the summits of the lofty eminence that hemmed me in, I was well disposed to think that I was in the happy valley, and that beyond those heights there was naught but a world of care and anxiety. As I extended my wanderings in the valley and grew more familiar with the habits of its inmates, I was fain to confess that despite the disadvantages of his condition, the Polynesian savage, surrounded by all the luxurious provisions of nature, enjoyed an infinitely happier, though certainly a less intellectual existence, than the self-complacent European. The naked wretch who shivers beneath the bleak skies and starves among the inhospitable wilds of Terra del Fuego might indeed be made happier by civilization, for it would alleviate his physical wants. But the voluptuous Indian, with every desire supplied, whom Providence has bountifully provided with all the sources of pure and natural enjoyment, and from whom are removed so many of the ills and pains of life, what has he to desire at the hands of civilization? She may cultivate his mind, may elevate his thoughts. These, I believe, are the established phrases. But will he be the happier? Let the once smiling and populous Hawaiian islands, with their now diseased, starving, and dying natives, answer the question. The missionaries may seek to disguise the matter as they will, but the facts are incontrovertible and the devoutest Christian who visits that group with an unbiased mind must go away mournfully asking, Are these, alas, the fruits of twenty-five years of enlightening? In a primitive state of society, the enjoyments of life, though few and simple, are spread over a great extent, and are unalloyed. But civilization, for every advantage she imparts, holds a hundred evils in reserve. The heart burnings, the jealousies, the social rivalries, the family dissensions, and the thousand self inflicted discomforts of refined life, which make up in units the swelling aggregate of human misery, are unknown among these unsophisticated people. 
but it will be urged that these shocking, unprincipled wretches are cannibals. Very true, and a rather bad trait in their character it must be allowed. But they are such only when they seek to gratify the passion of revenge upon their enemies. And I ask whether the mere eating of human flesh so very far exceeds in barbarity that custom which only a few years since was practiced in enlightened England. A convicted traitor, perhaps a man found guilty of honesty, patriotism, and such like heinous crimes, had his head lopped off with a huge axe, his bowels dragged out and thrown into a fire, while his body, carved into four quarters, was with his head exposed upon pikes, and permitted to rot and fester among the public haunts of men. The fiend-like skill we display in the invention of all manner of death-dealing engines, the vindictiveness with which we carry on our wars, and the misery and desolation that follow in their train, are enough of themselves to distinguish the white civilized man as the most ferocious animal on the face of the earth. His remorseless cruelty is seen in many of the institutions of our own favored land. There is one in particular lately adopted in one of the states of the Union, which purports to have been dictated by the most merciful considerations. To destroy our malefactors piecemeal, drying up in their veins, drop by drop, the blood we are too chicken-hearted to shed by a single blow which would at once put a period to their sufferings, is deemed to be infinitely preferable to the old-fashioned punishment of gibbeting much less annoying to the victim, and more in accordance with the refined spirit of the age. And yet how feeble is all language to describe the horrors we inflict upon these wretches, whom we mason up in the cells of our prisons, and condemn to perpetual solitude in the very heart of our population. But it is needless to multiply the examples of civilized barbarity. They far exceed in the amount of misery they cause, the crimes which we regard with such abhorrence in our less enlightened fellow-creatures. The term savage is, I conceive, often misapplied, and indeed when I consider the vices, cruelties, and enormities of every kind that spring up in the tainted atmosphere of a feverish civilization, I am inclined to think that so far as the relative wickedness of the parties is concerned, four or five Marquesan islanders sent to the United States as missionaries might be quite as useful as an equal number of Americans dispatched to the islands in a similar capacity. I once heard it given as an instance of the frightful depravity of a certain tribe in the Pacific, that they had no word in their language to express the idea of virtue. The assertion was unfounded, but were it otherwise, it might be met by stating that their language is almost entirely destitute of terms to express the delightful ideas conveyed by our endless catalogue of civilized crimes. In the altered frame of mind to which I have referred, every object that presented itself to my notice in the valley struck me in a new light, and the opportunities I now enjoyed of observing the manners of its inmates tended to strengthen my favorable impressions. One peculiarity that fixed my admiration was the perpetual hilarity reigning through the whole extent of the vale. There seemed to be no cares, griefs, troubles, or vexations in all Taipei. The hours tripped along as gaily as the laughing couples down a country dance. There were none of those thousand sources of irritation that the ingenuity of civilized man has created to mar his own felicity. There were no foreclosures of mortgages, no protested notes, no bills payable, no debts of honor in Taipei. No unreasonable tailors and shoemakers, perversely bent on being paid. No duns of any description. No assault and battery attorneys to foment discord, backing their clients up to a quarrel, and then knocking their heads together. No poor relations, everlastingly occupying the spare bedchamber, and diminishing the elbow room at the family table. No destitute widows, with their children starving on the cold charities of the world. No beggars, no debtors' prisons, no proud and hard-hearted nabobs in Taipei. Or to sum up all in one word, no money. That root of all evil was not to be found in the valley. In this secluded abode of happiness, there were no cross old women, 
no cruel step-dames, no withered spinsters, no lovesick maidens, no sour old bachelors, no inattentive husbands, no melancholy young men, no blubbering youngsters, and no squalling brats. All was mirth, fun, and high good humor. Blue devils, hypochondria, and doleful dumps went and hid themselves among the nooks and crannies of the rocks. Here you would see a parcel of children frolicking together the livelong day, and no quarreling, no contention among them. The same number in our own land could not have played together for the space of an hour without biting or scratching one another. There you might have seen a throng of young females, not filled with envyings of each other's charms, nor displaying the ridiculous affections of gentility, nor yet moving in whalebone corsets like so many automatons, but free, inartificially happy, and unconstrained. There were some spots in that sunny vale where they would frequently resort to decorate themselves with garlands of flowers. To have seen them reclining beneath the shadows of one of the beautiful groves, the ground about them strewn with freshly gathered buds and blossoms, employed in weaving chaplets and necklaces, one would have thought that all the train of flora had gathered together to keep a festival in honor of their mistress. With the young men there seemed almost always some matter of diversion or business on hand that afforded a constant variety of enjoyment. But whether fishing or carving canoes or polishing their ornaments, never was there exhibited the least sign of strife or contention among them. As for the warriors, they maintained a tranquil dignity of demeanor, journeying occasionally from house to house, where they were always sure to be received with the attention bestowed upon distinguished guests. The old men, of whom there were many in the vale, seldom stirred from their mats, where they would recline for hours and hours, smoking and talking to one another with all the garrulity of age. But the continual happiness, which so far as I was able to judge appeared to prevail in the valley, sprung principally from that all-pervading sensation which Rousseau has told us he at one time experienced, the mere buoyant sense of a healthful physical existence. And indeed in this particular the Taipees had ample reason to felicitate themselves, for sickness was almost unknown. During the whole period of my stay I saw but one invalid among them, and on their smooth, clear skins you observed no blemish or mark of disease. The general repose, however, upon which I have just been discanting, was broken in upon about this time by an event which proved that the islanders were not entirely exempt from those occurrences which disturbed the quiet of more civilized communities. Having now been a considerable time in the valley, I began to feel surprised that the violent hostility subsisting between its inhabitants and those of the adjoining Bay of Hapar should never have manifested itself in any warlike encounter. Although the valiant Taipees would often by gesticulations declare their undying hatred against their enemies, and the disgust they felt at their cannibal propensities, although they dilated upon the manifold injuries they had received at their hands, yet with a forbearance truly commendable they appeared patiently to sit down under their grievances, and to refrain from making any reprisals. The Hapars, entrenched behind their mountains, and never even showing themselves on their summits, did not appear to me to furnish adequate cause for that excess of animosity evinced towards them by the heroic tenants of our vale, and I was inclined to believe that the deeds of blood attributed to them had been greatly exaggerated. On the other hand, as the clamors of war had not up to this period disturbed the serenity of the tribe, I began to distrust the truth of those reports which ascribed so fierce and belligerent a character to the Taipei nation. Surely, thought I, all these terrible stories I have heard about the inveteracy with which they carried on the feud, their deadly intensity of hatred, and the diabolical malice with which they glutted their revenge upon the inanimate forms of the slain, are nothing more than fables and I must confess that I experienced something like a sense of regret at having my hideous anticipations thus disappointed. I felt in some sort like a prentice boy, who, going to the play in the expectation of being delighted with a cut-and-thrust tragedy, 
is almost moved to tears of disappointment at the exhibition of a genteel comedy. I could not avoid thinking that I had fallen in with a greatly traduced people, and I moralized not a little upon the disadvantage of having a bad name, which in this instance had given a tribe of savages, who were as pacific as so many lambkins, the reputation of a confederacy of giant killers. But subsequent events proved that I had been a little too premature in coming to this conclusion. One day, about noon, happening to be at the tea, I had lain down on the mats with several of the chiefs, and had gradually sunk into a most luxurious siesta, when I was awakened by a tremendous outcry, and starting up, beheld the natives seizing their spears and hurrying out while the most puissant of the chiefs, grasping the six muskets which were ranged against the bamboos, followed after, and soon disappeared in the groves. These movements were accompanied by wild shouts in which Hepar, Hepar, greatly predominated. The islanders were now to be seen running past the tea, and striking across the valley to the Hepar side. Presently I heard the sharp report of a musket from the adjoining hills, and then a burst of voices in the same direction. At this the women, who had congregated in the groves, set up the most violent clamors, as they invariably do here as elsewhere on every occasion of excitement and alarm, with a view of tranquilizing their own minds and disturbing other people. On this particular occasion they made such an outrageous noise, and continued it with such perseverance, that for a while, had entire volleys of musketry been fired off in the neighboring mountains, I should not have been able to have heard them. When this female commotion had a little subsided, I listened eagerly for further information. At last, bang, went another shot, and then a second volley of yells from the hills. Again all was quiet, and continued so for such a length of time, that I began to think the contending armies had agreed upon a suspension of hostilities. When pop went a third gun, followed as before with a yell, after this, for nearly two hours, nothing occurred worthy of comment, save some straggling shouts from the hillside, sounding like the halloos of a parcel of truant boys who had lost themselves in the woods. During this interval I had remained standing on the piazza of the tea, which directly fronted the Hapar Mountain, and with no one near me but Cory Cory and the old superannuated savages I have before described. These latter never stirred from their mats, and seemed altogether unconscious that anything unusual was going on. As for Cory Cory, he appeared to think that we were in the midst of great events, and sought most zealously to impress me with a due sense of their importance. Every sound that reached us conveyed some momentous item of intelligence to him. At such times, as if he were gifted with second sight, he would go through a variety of pantomimic illustrations, showing me the precise manner in which the redoubtable Taipees were at that very moment chastising the insolence of the enemy. Mahavi hana pepi nui hapar, he exclaimed every five minutes, giving me to understand that under that distinguished captain the warriors of his nation were performing prodigies of valor. Having heard only four reports from the muskets, I was led to believe that they were worked by the islanders in the same manner as the Sultan Solomon's ponderous artillery at the siege of Byzantium, one of them taking an hour or two to load and train. At last, no sound whatever proceeding from the mountains, I concluded that the contest had been determined one way or the other. Such appeared indeed to be the case, for in a little while a courier arrived at the tea, almost breathless with his exertions and communicated the news of a great victory having been achieved by his countrymen. Hapar Puarva! Hapar Puarva! The cowards had fled. Cory Cory was in ecstasies, and commenced a vehement harangue, which, so far as I understood it, implied that the result exactly agreed with his expectations, and which, moreover, was intended to convince me that it would be a perfectly useless undertaking, even for an army of fire-eaters, to offer battle to the irresistible heroes of our valley. In all this I of course acquiesced, and looked forward with no little interest to the return of the conquerors, whose victory I feared might not have been purchased without cost to themselves. But here I was again mistaken, 
for Mahavy, in conducting his warlike operations, rather inclined to the Fabian than to the Bonapartian tactics, husbanding his resources and exposing his troops to no unnecessary hazards. The total loss of the victors in this obstinately contested affair was, in killed, wounded, and missing, one forefinger and part of a thumbnail, which the late proprietor brought along with him in his hand, a severely contused arm, and a considerable effusion of blood flowing from the thigh of a chief, who had received an ugly thrust from a hapar spear. What the enemy had suffered I could not discover, but I presume they had succeeded in taking off with them the bodies of their slain. Such was the issue of the battle, as far as its results came under my observation, and as it appeared to be considered an event of prodigious importance, I reasonably concluded that the wars of the natives were marked by no very sanguinary traits. I afterwards learned how the skirmish had originated. A number of the Hapars had been discovered prowling for no good purpose on the Taipee side of the mountain. The alarm was sounded, and the invaders, after a protracted resistance, had been chased over the frontier. But why had not the intrepid Mahavi carried the war into Hapar? Why had he not made a descent into the hostile vale, and brought away some trophy of his victory, some materials for the cannibal entertainment which I had heard usually terminated every engagement? After all, I was much inclined to believe that such shocking festivals must occur very rarely among the islanders, if indeed they ever take place. For two or three days the late event was the theme of general comment, after which the excitement gradually wore away, and the valley resumed its accustomed tranquillity. 